Aloha, everyone, and thank you for joining the COVID-19 Public Health Action Webinar, Food Access and Food Sustainability in Hawaii. My name is Steph Moyer, and I'm the Community Initiatives and Training Coordinator for the Hawaii Public Health Institute. Before we get started, just want to go over some Zoom housekeeping. For all questions, please utilize the chat box or questions and answers box located at the bottom of your screen. We are not offering continuing education credits for this webinar series. And lastly, all webinars are being recorded and will be posted to the Hawaii Public Health Training Hui's YouTube channel. It's my honor to introduce you to our guest moderator and guest speakers for today. First is our moderator, Tammy Chase Brunel. She is the SNAP-Ed Coordinator in the Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion Division at the Department of Health. As the SNAP-Ed Coordinator, Tammy works with community partners to address healthy food access and physical activity for low-income individuals throughout the state. Tammy designs and coordinates SNAP-Ed program goals, strategies, interventions, implementation, and evaluation activities. Tammy holds a master's in health education and has worked in the public health field for over 15 years. Our first speaker today is Hunter Haitlin. He is the Hawaii Food Resilience Program Manager contracted by Hawaii Public Health Institute. In that role, his work focuses on Hawaii's COVID-19 food crisis, collecting and producing data on hunger and feeding programs to aid response strategies. Over the past decade, he has worked with individuals, communities, organizations, and networks to address issues of environmental quality, social equity, food and economic security, and urbanization. He is a PhD student at UH Manoa, researching Hawaii's agro-food system development and food crises over the 20th century. Through research, education, facilitation, and design, his work navigates social and ecological systems toward the development of sustainable human habitats. Next speaker we have today is Sarah Freeman. Sarah is the Food Access Coordinator for Hawaii County and the facilitator for the Hawaii Island Food Alliance. In her position, she is working towards developing a food system development plan for the county, and she works with diverse partners to increase collaboration, effectiveness, and efficiency on projects that increase access to fresh local food to low-income residents and that work to improve the food system. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Conservation and Resource Studies from UC Berkeley, with a concentrated focus on urban agriculture, conflict resolution, and city repair. She currently serves on the Farm to School Hui Steering Circle, along with the School Food System Circle, and is supporting development and implementation of garden to cafeteria programs statewide with the School Food Safety Circle. Next speaker today is Joelle Edwards. Joelle is Food Access Coordinator and Farm to School Program Manager with Malama Kauai. She helps to lead a collaborative stakeholder group of farm to school partners across the island and assisting in incubating their ideas into tangible projects. She is also a certified learning and development specialist with extensive nonprofit and for profit project management and marketing experience. She currently serves on the state farm to school Hui steering school food systems, garden to cafeteria, and farm to ECE committees. She is passionate about facilitating increased local food access. And last but not least, we have Lauren Lohr. Lauren is the community coordinator for the Healthy Eating Active Living Coalition for Maui, Moloka'i, and Lanai, and the food access coordinator for Maui County with the Hawaii Public Health Institute. Lauren is originally from New York City and has her master's in public health from Long Island University, Brooklyn campus. She has worked with various nonprofit organizations such as the New York Common Pantry and the Partnership for a Healthier New York City. Lauren is also a certified holistic health coach through the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. She has been living on Maui for over three years, working with the HEAL Coalition and the Maui Nui Food Alliance to increase access to healthy food, increase SNAP EBT access at the farmer's markets, 
and increase access and connectivity to the built environment for Maui, Molokai, and Lanai. And without further ado, I will turn it over to Hunter. All right. Aloha and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Hunter Hevelin, the Hawaii Food Resilience Program Manager with HiFi, and glad you can all be here today. My role in five minutes is to try and give an overview of food systems, uh, some of the, the lingo associated, and some of the issues that we face in, across the state. And so to start things off, I, I think we wanted to open with sort of the setting the table, um, where we're at in terms of economic security in the state. And the map that you see up there is the Alice households, so asset limited, income constrained, um, and employed, along with households of poverty, we can see across the state the extent of economic insecurity that we currently face. And the importance of opening with economic insecurity is that it directly interfaces with food security and food insecurity in particular. And looking at the fiscal year 2019, we can see that that food insecurity and economic insecurity had led to 11% of the state, one in nine. Uh, individuals across the state participating in the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program through the USDA, so essentially what used to be called food stamps. So when we talk about economic insecurity, food insecurity, a lot of different words get thrown around, and I think it's important to start with how we think about food and agriculture. Let me go to the, the next slide. And so we, I, as a food systems planner, think about food as systems, right? And we can think of food access as being a component of food insecurity. And that's a lot of what we'll be talking about today. So that area in, in that section of this diagram in red, but food access um, is only one component we can think about in terms of food systems and in terms of framing food security. We could also be thinking about sort of whether food is actually available, whether it's cult culturally appropriate or acceptable. Um, and so today, a lot of what we're covering is thinking through this sort of food access lens, right? So is food accessible? And so again, uh, recognizing that the significant decrease in income um, is really a big part of what we're facing as a byproduct of the, the crisis today. And while some of these concepts might be new, we also open with food sustainability. And so the capacity of a food system to function within the sort of biophysical limits of the ecology, the, the environment that it's situated within, is also an important component. And then my role as well is looking at food system resilience, sort of another side of the coin about how able a particular food system is to withstand shocks and to continue functioning before we get to something like say a food crisis or a failure in the food system. And while a number of these concepts might be new, uh, these issues really are not. So if you go to the next slide. And so we can see that in Hawaii even, um, we've faced food disruptions in the past from World War I. This is actually, a, and this is not a joke, an organization that was called the Banana Consuming Propaganda Committee was out there supporting local agriculture as a mechanism to address food shortages, which is different than the issue that we face now. Our food supply lines are still functioning, but our ability to access that food because of disruptions to our economic systems is what we face today. But it's important to also think about this historically because of the long shadow of how we frame response efforts, right? And so the decisions made impact our palates and shape our plates for decades. Particularly, an example is Spam. Spam Musubi, a favorite of mine, uh, is something that entered the palate in Hawaii during World War II as part of the food response efforts that happened there. So in this moment, we're really trying to figure out how we can integrate more local agriculture into addressing the needs of the communities that we face, uh, the issues that we face across communities. So you can go to the next slide. So when we look at how this particular period is different, we're not advocating the state, uh, the, the nation is not saying victory gardens, we should all get out there. There's certainly some shifts in the ability of people to have enough space to even meaningfully produce an, some volume of food that's going to address their, their meal gap. But we can also see this, this uh, outline, rough outline of some of the vulnerable systems and how they've been impacted, whether it's um, delays in CARES funding being released, uh, unemployment system backlogs impacting the ability of people to have credit, um, stigma around the use of federal entitlement progr programs like SNAP. And so there's this whole sort of nesting of issues that have come, come together to help produce this food crisis and this food um, disruptions that we face today. 
Next slide. And while there's a lot of different numbers out there um, from the household pulse survey to the COVID impact surveys that range from say 17 to 35% in terms 17 to 23% for overall food insecurity. Um, some of the better data in my perspective comes from uh, Feeding America, which produced a COVID um, based projection about food insecurity by county. And then we can see that that also works aligns fairly well with the increase of so the line in green uh, being calls to the Aloha United Way's 211 system that were related to food. So we see this significant spike in public uh, requests for food assistance. So there's a lot of work to be done uh, to address these issues. You can go to the next slide. We know uh, that a lot of that work has been put on the shoulders of the food banks across the state, most of which are participating in the Hawaii Hunger Action Network that have estimated four to $6 million needed to just keep them functioning through December. And that's with the assumption of a 50 to 75% decrease in demand. But we know that the, or well, at this point it appears that the $600 unemployment assistance uh, through CARES funding that gets tacked on to unemployment filings is probably gonna be ending soon. So th these numbers may shift drastically depending on the actions of federal programming. And it becomes then very important for better coordination that needs to happen at a county level, at a community level. And fortunately, uh, entities like the Department of Health, who's just about to share with some of their work, have been stepping up to support these efforts. I'll pass it along to Tammy. Thank you, Hunter. And thank you everyone for having me here today. As Stephanie mentioned, my name is Tammy Chase Brunel and I am the Department of Health SNAP-Ed Coordinator. The Department of Health SNAP-Ed program works to increase healthy food access among low-income communities. So we, before we start with the panel, I'm gonna give everyone a brief history on how this project came about and Department of Health's involvement in it. So in 2017, the Hawaii Food System Food for All report was completed by Ken Meter after analysis of stakeholders from every major island. The report's findings suggested that while strengthening our community food system will require that we grow more food, it will also take a concentrated effort of leaders from diverse backgrounds to ensure that this food feeds those who need it the most. So if you want to go to the next slide. As part of this effort, in 2018, the Department of Health SNAP-Ed program wanted to support a community-based approach where communities have an active role and participate in not only highlighting the issue around food access, but also work to address them. And so from this vision, the Food Access Capacity Building project came about. The purpose of this project is to expand capacity to establish county specific efforts and seek to create policy systems and environmental changes that will facilitate food access within the low income communities. So the Department of Health, we put out a request for proposals and the County of Hawaii, Malama Kauai and Hawaii Public Health Institute all stepped up to take on the project. Now, at this time, I do want to mention we do not have an Oahu Food Access Coordinator, but we are working on this, so don't worry, and we hope to have one in the very near future. So if you want to go to the next slide, these are just some beautiful photos of um, Malama Kauai's work. And then if you want to go to the next slide, this is the Maui Nui Food Alliance. And then one more. Uh, next slide go. And this is the Hawaii Island Food Alliance. So how has COVID-19 impacted this work? Now, I'm not going to go into the specifics. That is what your panel is here for. But I will tell you this, before COVID-19, the food access coordinators were already working with their county level coalitions on sustainable food access. This put them all in a unique position to be able to pivot their conversations and start looking at food access during an emergency. So since the coalitions already had all the partners at the table, this potentially saved valuable time in their response. So if you wanna to go to the next slide, we're gonna hear about their work. Um, so question number one, I'm gonna ask the question and then we're gonna go through each county and hear some responses. So the first question is, um, 
for you to talk about your role and your work before COVID-19 and then how did it shift as a response to, to COVID-19? And we're gonna start with Kauai. So Joelle, can you talk about your role and your work and how it shifted? And next slide, please. Thank you for having us today. Um, so uh, prior to COVID, uh, my role with Malama Kauai and uh, the Farm to State Hui was uh, leading Kauai's Farm to Stool stakeholders team. So that was a, a group of community stakeholders um, representing education, agriculture, um, healthcare, food access, and other community organizations. And we were just working for leadership to find some actors, ac answers and solutions for food access, including um, working towards getting farmers, con local farmers contracted for the Ainapono program, and also um, facilitating school food pantries on um, up to eight of our campuses before uh, pre-COVID. Um, post, it shifted quite quickly. So um, we shifted to immediate food access um, for across the country or across the county um, while we're supporting our local farmers. So that was the main thing, supporting our local farm community while providing uh, food access to our newly um, unemployed um, jobless community, as well as Kapuna, Keiki, at risk, those folks that were unable to get to their food pantries like that they normally could. Um, we also started collecting and posting outlets for local food purchasing and of course emergency food systems on and that's on our next page you can see next slide is the local food connector that's kind of an info hub um, that we maintain daily if not um, a couple every few hours where um, you can go and if you have the means buy local food um, the farmers connection where um, emergency feeding resources are as well as food safety um, we were also supporting the DOE with their feeding sites, um, finding containers, um, advocating for those signups for free and reduced, also advocating for SNAP signups. And then there was some areas that did not quite yet have grab and go meal sites. So we pivoted and um, facilitated drive through produce and food pantries. And that was with the support again of our local farmers and Hawaii Food Bank Hawaii. Um, in April and May, we actually distributed 6,000 locally grown CSA bags, including home delivery for our at-risk and vulnerable um, community that could not get to any of those feeding sites. Thank you, Joelle. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to move on to Maui. So Lauren, can you please tell us about your role and your work before COVID-19 and then how has it changed after? Yeah, for sure. Um, thanks so much for having us today. So before COVID-19, I um, coordinated, still do, the Healthy Eating Active Living Coalition. Um, and our focus areas, one is access to healthy food, um, but the others are built environment and workforce wellness. So to be able to have the opportunity to also be part-time as a food access coordinator um, was really great to help provide lift um, to the new Maui Nui Food Alliance. Um, so before that, we had really formed a steering committee for the Food Alliance, um, hoping to have more convenings, hoping to have kind of a strong foundation for this alliance to bring um, all sectors and folks from the food system here on Maui for all three islands together. Um, after COVID-19 um, happened, it really did turn into more focus towards food access and collecting data. So just trying to kind of catch up with coordination and really trying to figure out how to support the food bank, um, other distribution sites, the DOE distribution sites, um, and also make connections with any local farmers that we already had within our networks. Um, so it was definitely a lot of catch up of just trying to reach out to folks and see where the needs are, where the gaps are. Um, we provided a food access poster that had the, um, the hours and the, um, yeah, the times for your grocery stores and what schools were providing DOE grab and go meals, stuff like that. Um, definitely was a little difficult trying to figure out the best way to um, use our time as the Food Alliance, but we've been convening bi-weekly um, and making sure that to bring any um, community needs to the table and figuring out how to coordinate and address those within the community. 
Thank you, Lauren. So now we're gonna hear from Hawaii County. So Sarah, can you talk about your role and your work and how has it changed since COVID-19? Sure, thank you so much. Um, so first, I started the position in Hawaii County. My position is located in the Research and Development Office. Um, I started in October. Uh, as part of my position, I also facilitate the Hawaii Island Food Alliance. We're now roughly 125 different members um, of cross-sector partnership. And that partner is, partnership is really working on supporting the food system as a whole and developing a food system action plan for the county. Um, so we, when we've been working on that, um, when the you know COVID happened, everything as far as network development and partnership development, all that work really went into hyperdrive. And I was really, really impressed by all the networks within the county and also statewide and how everyone started really coming together really quickly and really trying to really increase their communication and understanding what everyone was doing. And there's always been a lot of focus through this process on understanding where the gaps are. Um, another way where this has really changed where I um, have been focusing on is understanding funding and resources and really trying to find ways to push that out into the community so people understand different resources that are being provided. Uh, we, as HIFA and different members, we developed a list of different community feeding sites so that could be shared widely, but we could also understand uh, what everyone is doing. And I got to dive you know, deeply into all of the FEMA and CARES Act funding and any potential funding that would be available to the different efforts for, you know, related to feeding, but also supporting local agriculture. Um, it's been quite a, a learning experience and I'm still learning and working on that. Um, and you know, really just that role of, has just increased exponentially. And I just wanna overall say that the partnerships that have been built and all the work that's been done um, in Hawaii County has been exceptional and I've been really you know, honored to be a part of it. Thank you, Sarah. So let's hear from a statewide perspective. Um, Hunter, can you tell us about your role and work and how it has changed since COVID-19? And then we'll move on to question two. Sure. Um, I've been a food system planner for many years and had a lot of my work had been focused just in this period on some legislative activity, but had also, I think most recently, that's somewhat related to this food system better understandings of the food system was a, a recent study on local food price and availability that ideally at some point going forward we'll be able to kind of scaffold on to try and get a sense of what the, the scale of investment would be what scale of investment would be required to integrate local production into the emergency food response system um, and so I, I fortunately was already doing research on um, food crises in Hawaii in World War One and World War Two, so it was particularly timely uh, that I already had been developing that that kind of historical period uh, vantage point. Thank you, Hunter. You can go to the next slide. So now we're going to move on to question number two. So what are the greatest needs? So you know, think Keiki Kapuna, houseless, and what gaps did you see? Also, what specific partnerships were formed in response to this work? So next slide, please. And we're gonna start with Kauai again. So Joelle, can you tell us what the greatest needs are for Kauai and what gaps do, did you see and what specific partnerships formed? Um, I really did not see that one, one area had more need than the other. And it was really reminiscent of the April floods of 2018. So. Once again, Kauai really came through and has done an amazing job with uh, setting up a wide variety of food pantries and meal pro programs to help all over the county with emergency food, re food resources. Um, with limited financial support available for most in need, um, our biggest uh, push was to push SNAP, um, to Bucks opportunities for immediate relief. But the stores accepting it should really be buying um, more local products, of course. Um, there's still a huge barrier for farmers to get into the stores here and keep that funding local. Um, but as far as the greatest need, you know, we were at the beginning really focused on Keiki and Kapuna and, and had some agencies come to us and realize that there's a group right in the middle um, that were homebound 
um, had lost their jobs, had relied on public transportation in the past, and were unable to get to any of these emergency um, food resources, uh, some mental health issues. And so that's why we started the home delivery program. Um, we're currently delivering to over 200 households a week. And, um, and that's all local produce as well. As far as our specific partnerships, you can go to the next slide. And I do need to, oh, whoop, sorry, back, back up one, sorry. Um, I do need to a uh, shout out to CTAR. I neglected to put their logo on here, but they have been unbelievable um, as far as all of their extension agencies on that as well. So um, we really excelled again in this area, especially with um, so many partnerships being developed after the flood. We really got to see who gets things done and who works well with others. Um, too many great partners to the list, but we've seen a lot of great things happen with Hawaii Food Bank, County of Kauai Administration, and Office of Economic Development Team, the Hawaii Community Foundation, of course the DOE, Department of Health, and uh, CTAR, and lots of small, nimble nonprofits who, who are embedded in their communities. Everyone has really brought their best foot forward and all their resources to the table when it comes to helping one another here. It has been so impressive and so it's such an honor to be part of what we've been doing. And when you take from taking intake calls at the beginning of folks that are needing help to follow up calls and understanding just what an impact everybody has on, um, on this community is just unbelievable. And, and I'm so grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Joelle. So we're going to move on to Maui. So Lauren, can you tell us what the greatest needs are for Maui? What gaps did you see and what partnerships were formed? Yeah, for sure. Um, I would definitely echo Joelle and it was it's difficult to pick one population or group um, when it comes to Keiki Kapuna or those that are in the middle that are caretakers who have lost their jobs um, during this time, um, definitely try to look at it very holistically. So, but I think specifically when it comes to our SNAP access points um, for uh, fresh fruits and vegetables, that's definitely a gap um, and a need that we've been trying to address uh, for a few years now. Um, also stigma with accessing emergency food. Um, although there has been really with the partnerships, um, again, to echo Joel, to see the community come together um, for all three islands, the Maui Food Bank, um, definitely shipping more food over to Molokai and Lanai um, every week. Uh, they have served in the month of May over 33,000 people. And then they have um, distributed, I think almost 550,000 pounds of food throughout the county. And the partnerships that they were able to make with local farmers um, through help with the county, um, Maui County definitely stepped up as well um, with providing um, funds to purchase local produce to then funnel to the food bank um, and to other, um, you know, to the Farm Bureau and to the Farmers Union. Um, the YMCA was definitely able to partner with Grow Some Good to start some initiatives about um, plant distribution and community gardens and food distributions as well. MEO, um, also with funding from the county, was able to um, facilitate the HELP program, which is the Hawaii Emergency Laulima Partnership that provided extra funds um, you know, meeting for those that meet requirements who are unemployed as well. So having different programs out there um, amongst all of these different nonprofits um, and the county to provide funding for that has been really awesome to see. Um, my role isn't um, as direct service, but to be able to hear the stories from our coalition members of the HEAL Coalition and then also for the Maui Nui Food Alliance um, has been really wonderful to see kind of what partnerships have formed, where people are coming together, um, putting out, you know, blasts to networks um, about the need for donations, um, especially when COVID-19 first started, it was really hard um, to get physical donations um, to the Maui Food Bank. So folks that were able to donate monetarily or through their virtual food drive that they have online was really great um, to see the community accessing that and recognizing that it was definitely a need. Um, and the projection for those numbers for the food bank will most likely go up. So I think just trying to figure out ways to sustain that through these partnerships is gonna be really important, but really wonderful to see um, 
you know, how people can come together. And on the screen, the boxes are from the Maui Food Bank. Those are their photos um, of the produce that they've been able to distribute into the community. Thank you, Lauren. Um, Sarah, let's move on to Hawaii County. What are the greatest needs and gaps you see for Hawaii County and what partnerships have formed? So I, the, the picture I put on the screen, um, that is just overall representative of something I've been thinking about lately um, as far as the DOE um, and also just how rural Hawaii Island is and how far, you know, especially in the Ka'u district and also in Puna, how, you know, in other areas within the island, how far some of the students are away from schools and how that has impacted their availability of access to food um, during the pandemic. Um, so this is something that we really hope to get more data on and to provide better programs, feeding programs in the future really for the DOE schools. There was the emergency meals to you program um, and we really tried to, you know, get as many schools on that as possible. But there, you know, if the school is open as a grab and go site, it can't also be an emergency meals to you site currently. So, and you can see what the numbers are, of what the students, uh, what percentage of students were actually being reached in those areas. So that's one area that I did see a gap uh, that we're trying to see how we can improve in the future. I think overall, you know, as, you know, as far as partnerships from the beginning of this, there's a lot of, you know, meetings with the county and the Hawaii Food Basket. My food basket really stepped up and changed their model as far as food distribution. They started Ohana drops and these are these Ohana drops that they now have 14 um, a month all around the island. They're supposed to be 14 days of food and that represents, uh, they have a lot of local food in those boxes as well as non-perishables. And there's been other companies and other, you know, bringing milk or eggs and we, for the farmers to family food box program through Suisan for the first six weeks was able to provide cooked meat. Um, but that unfortunately is not going to be able to continue. Um, but the county's worked really, really closely with the um, food bank, helping with PNR sites, and also the National Guard has helped and stepped in for distribution, which has been really important since there could be anywhere between 500 to 2,000 cars in a two hour session. So having the National Guard um, and having the county request that for the food bank was really, really crucial to their operation. Um, also, in the very beginning of the crisis, uh, council member uh, Ashley Kirkowitz helped support, develop, activate Hawaii Aid, which also created this flow over for people to either fill out a survey or call to ask if they need food assistance or if they'd like to support. Um, this really helped as far as capacity uh, for those, you know, through the food bank was really, really over capacity. Uh, the county also helped fund a uh, COVID response manager for the food bank to help you know, add some capacity to their organization. Um, Activate Hawaii Aid also took on some of the Kiki Care Pack functionality along with other really amazing partners um, to distribute out food and activity packs for kids during this time. There's been a really amazing Kapuna network that formed. They've been working together, getting out, you know, supplies for Kapuna just so they don't have to go out and look for basic toiletries and other supplies that they need during all the, you know, the crazed buying that happened in the beginning of the pandemic and there's there's more you know more and more partnerships um, that were just really amazing and we're really tracking those and a big part of you know the work I was trying to do in the beginning and continually is to understand who's doing what what are their needs and is there funding available for them and so it's been a ongoing process um, but again it's been really amazing to be a part of Thank you, Sarah. Uh, so we'll move on to Hunter. Hunter, can you tell us from a statewide perspective what the greatest needs and gaps you see are and what partnerships formed? Sure. Uh, I think the, as everyone has sort of echoed, comparison of needs is difficult, um, but we can think of them as sort of how we compile needs and outreach. Um, we know that in terms of Keiki, this, the projections are saying something to the level of around 30% food insecurity for children in the state. Um, and for families with children, it hovers even just a little bit above that. So fortunately, we've had school feeding programs um, that have been going on. Kupuna, uh, on the other hand, 
in many cases homebound, fortunately have had support from the state executive office on aging and the county entities that then are able to route funding support towards Kupuna. But we know that there's still significant gaps in terms of state and county investments in food banks, as well as trying to ensure that at least some portion of the, those investments would ideally be earmarked for local production and, and local food. Um, all of this sounds very complicated, but I would say in terms of a gap, one primary thing is thinking about equity, right? Going back to that first slide about economic security and its relationship with food insecurity is living wages, right? That is a state level jurisdictional action that could significantly impact the ability of families to provide for themselves across the state. Fortunately, um, this is not a new idea and there have been many coalitions for a long time that have working, been working on this. In terms of newer partnerships, um, at least a couple that I've been a part of, uh, the Kupuna Food Security Coalition on Oahu has come together from the Executive Office or the Elderly Affairs Division at the county, along with AARP and many others and service providers to help coordinate data and understanding about how Kupuna are receiving services and how to ensure expansion and continuity of those um, services through this pandemic. At the statewide level, there's been an agricultural response and recovery working group which has been working diligently uh, since mid-March uh, to bring together stakeholders from across uh, agriculture and across the state to generate a list of recommendations that will both address community feeding needs, agricultural viability and sustainability in terms of um, economic functioning, while trying to ensure that everybody stays afloat and we're integrating more local production into um, state and emergency uh, feeding programs. Thank you, Hunter, and thank you all. In the beginning, I mentioned this was a community-based approach, and as you can hear, the community partners have been involved throughout the whole process, and that, in my mind, is always just so great to hear. Um, so we're going to move on to the final question, uh, which is, what is needed to strengthen food systems in Hawaii? And we're going to look at that county specific. So how can we, and how can we invest in achieving local food sustainability? So uh, if you want to go to the next slide, and we're going to talk to Joelle and Kauai. What is needed to strengthen Kauai's food systems, and how can we invest in achieving local food sustainability? Uh, thanks again. So and there's actually two, and I, uh, to not just our farmers, but also our food banks, and to kind of echo what Hunter just said, just having a state and county um, dedication to food banks. Our early work pre-COVID, we, we were able to recognize that um, there are plenty of families here on Kauai that are unable to make ends meet, and we're needing food bank assistance but the food pantry hours were not uh, cohesive to work work schedules. So um, by partnering Hawaii Food Bank with the DOE, um, we were able to set up eight food pantries within, within those campuses to assist with that. And I think that that's going to be an ongoing need. Um, what I'd like to see coming out of those food banks as well is, is or the food pantries is the availability, availability for those food pantries and those local chapters to buy local produce, local meat, local eggs, um, which is going to help the economy. And immediately, you know, we need to invest in what our local farmers have been asking for for decades. That's affordable housing, long term land and water access food hub facilities, and of course, financial support outside of just loans. Um, right now, our team on Kauai would love to see ag parks and a food hub in every MOKU and with on-site affordable housing options. As a state, we've been talking about this for decades, but the actions and investments have been too slow and, and almost too small. So we need, to, um, we need to make being a farmer supportive and attractive if we're going to build our food supply and, and um, self-sufficiency. As far as resources, um, uh, hopefully we can get the USDA to move um, speedily to facilitate um, more um, farms where we're gonna be able, farmers markets where we're gonna be able to offer SNAP and to Bucks. Um, we need large investments into workforce development to our families so they can get back on their feet. Infrastructure development support for our farms so they can focus on increasing production with safe, and innovative distribution methods, including getting our larger re retailers to purchase more locally. 
So I think by strengthening both of those, then uh, we're gonna see so many good changes. Thank you. Thank you, Joelle. So let's move on to Maui. Lauren, what is needed to strengthen Maui's food system and how can we invest in achieving local food sustainability? Um, a lot of what Joelle said. <laughs> um, I would say very similarly, um, I would add to with our county currently investing a lot of funds, um, emergency funds, they plan to invest CARES Act funds towards agriculture, but figuring out the sustainability like what does this look like after um and again who knows what after looks like but how do we sustain um some of this funding and how things are invested and how farmers are supported in the future and echoing everything um that joelle said um supporting local farmers supporting a workforce i think also supporting um and investing in agriculture education um from farm to school um really making sure that they're that that is a, a part of a culture of workforce here um not just in maui but in hawaii and um i think to also producing food that is culturally appropriate that the community does want that the production of food will make sense to the community and they will purchase it as well um, and also to invest in full-time food access coordination. I think that's been kind of one of the harder things uh, during this time is that, you know, there really needs to be more folks um, working towards this effort. And uh, hopefully we can get, again, more sustainable funding, more folks able to, you know, work with all three islands to have a successful food system to support us. Thank you, Lauren. Sarah, let's hear about Hawaii County. What is needed to strengthen Hawaii County's food system and how can we invest in achieving local food sustainability? Thanks, Tammy. I really wanna echo what Joelle and uh, Lauren both shared and also just restating what Lauren said at the end about investing in food access coordinators. I think um, it's their crucial positions, both in county and within nonprofit organizations. I think they should exist in both and they really help that network, you know, com in community collaboration. Um, so I think that that's really important. It's such a big question. I also wanted to bring up, um, you know, what Joelle said as well about supporting the food banks and that's food security. Um, it's currently pretty dire on the short term and the food bank needs a lot more support and investment and uh, because lots of orders have been canceled and this is really needing, um, you know, we're needing getting that food out, getting more people signed up for SNAP. But then also back to what Hunter said in the very beginning, if we wanna talk about food security on our island, we need to talk about having a living wage and, you know, and reducing the amount of people that are in poverty and are at our Alice. So if you don't have the funds to purchase food, it's hard to have, you know, and also if you live in rural areas, it's really hard to access fresh, healthy food within your budget. Um, that is why Double Up Food Bucks, you know, through SNAP is such a great program and investing more into that is very important so people can have greater access to fresh local food. Um, making procurement through, you know, state institutions, through hospitals, prisons, and schools, and make, you know, kind of, decentralizing that procurement process so we can have more local based procurement uh, and getting more of those local foods into those places and really supporting our local farmers. We have to really re-envision so many systems uh, within that change. Um, and we also, when we talk about needing, we need access to land, we need access to resources, we need to produce more of our own inputs and build that infrastructure. All that takes training and education and buy-in and high level management. So there's, it's so many different levels of support. And I think through these network buildings, buildings that we're doing on in Hawaii County and across the state through the different networks, we're really trying to build and try to you know, assess and work on those problems. Um, but it's gonna, take, it's gonna take a lot and it's gonna take a lot of effort. But I think that, um, I think that it is, you know, I think it is possible at the same time, I know that some of these conversations have been happening for the last 20 years. I am very heartened that how much through this pandemic, the import, talking about the importance of local agriculture, talking about the importance of you know, food security is really coming in the, you know, in the spotlight. 
and is putting more action and resources behind it. Um, as far as, you know, funding, you know, our CARES funding, we have until the end of the year to spend it. It's, it's really challenging to find appropriate ways that we can use it to support agriculture and feeding people now and supporting our economy. And we're really going to be in this place after where everyone's really economically sure, unsure about the future. So it will really be a time for us to envision, work together and build what we've been talking about for quite some time. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you, Sarah. One thing that stands out to me as everybody is answering for the county level is that a lot of the stuff is consistent. So even though it is a community-based approach and that the needs and solutions are coming from the county, we're still seeing it consistently throughout every county. So finally, I, I wanna hear from Hunter. Um, so please share with us what you see as um, a need to strengthen the statewide food system and how we can invest in achieving local food sustainability. Sure, I think, I think one, the sort of popular trope in talking about food insecurity that was part of at least my, a lot of my discussions in the agricultural community is, what if the ships stop coming? Um, and I think this particular crisis gives us an opportunity to, to really assess the extent to which local agriculture in the absence of additional entitlement programs and mechanisms to increase the economic resources with within communities across the state, the extent to which local agriculture can actually fill that gap um, in terms of food programming, right? So the ships are still coming, but our communities are hungry. Um, and we've long sort of pushed for a food system that doesn't leave anyone hungry and doesn't leave any farmer fraught, but there's can be sort of tensions between these two, not to say contradictory frames of food security, but um, ideally complementary. but there needs to be entitlement programs to support them. Uh, particularly when the fair farm gate price rarely meets the budget of the family down the street. And so to get towards that in the short term, I think direct producer support and capacity building in the form of say micro grants and training programs uh, is a great place to start um, to ensure that producers are able to sustain themselves now so that they can be continue to be part of our food system going forward, whether it's an emergency or not. But we also need to ensure that all federal entitlement program resources are being accessed. There is a whole morass of uh, federal programming that gives funding in various different ways and pockets um, to state and counties. And we, want, we need to do some more work to try and highlight which of those are being accessed. Are they being utilized to the extent possible? Are there ways that we can utilize, say, state or county funding to support um, and build upon those existing programs? And finally, um, really, in terms of the, the longer term economic development, food resilience and equity planning, we need to be thinking about emergency food plans involving commercial food distributors, um, figuring out where SNAP expansions can have, how to better integrate local production through double box type programming. Um, and overall, I mean, the, the, the recommendation uh, from HIMA and FEMA is that we have three or 14 days of food supply on hand, should God forbid, another uh, disaster come our way. And so we need to have programs at county and state levels to facilitate people to actually have that initial reserve should this crisis uh, get even worse. Thank you, Hunter. And thank you all for the work that you've done and the work that the, your county level coalitions have done and all your community partners. Um, I'm sure everybody on this webinar is just as much in awe of the work that's been done as I am. So thank you. And now I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie for Q&A. Thank you, Tammy. So first question we have is, I would like to hear any info on the Bucks program or card that SNAP recipients received recently and if there are any plans to include more stores participating, especially on the neighbor islands. So Stephanie, I can answer that question. Um, I wanted to take the opportunity um, on this webinar to announce the expansion of the Debucks program. So as of today, the Food Basket, which is Hawaii Islands Food Bank, expanded its Debucks Double Up Food Bucks program to a total of 30 participating grocery stores. Um, so the Debucks program, for those who are not familiar, partners with food retailers to make Hawaii-grown fruits and vegetables more affordable 
for SNAP card holders, and each participate in retailer doubles the value of SNAP dollars. So this helps SNAP participants bring home more healthy fruits and vegetables while supporting the local farmers. So I really encourage everybody to just take a few moments, visit debucks.org after this webinar and find a participate in retailer near you um, because there's a lot more now as of today and we're very grateful for the food basket for this. Thank you. Next question we have is for Joelle. Kauai seems very proactive, congratulations. Do you think the size of the population makes a difference? Do you feel your mayor plays a part? Um, well, I, I certainly plenty of people plays a part. We, we do have a smaller population, but um, we also are heavily impacted by tourism like the rest of the counties are and severe job loss. And we had, as you can see, we were at 43% um, um, below or at, or below poverty level even prior to this. But, um, you know, the mayor has been proactive, so it certainly has helped our, our numbers as far as infections and maintaining um, any further infections. Also, he's been great where he has daily updates and helps assist all these agencies in getting the word out for food access um, facilitating um, food emergency feeding resources that the county did as well as working with with um, uh, all the partners and uh, throughout the island I think that again we because of what we went through in 2018 with the flood and I live in that community that was very affected by that flood our road was closed for 18 months we did not have access to food readily without having it flown in for a little bit um, by the National Guard and then setting up. We, we had no food pantry up here. And um, we we're so pleased because that food pantry that was gonna stop once our food, once our road opened, um, the need was identified as still being in need no matter what. And so I think that we've just been able to pivot. And in this, we, we gather those resources quickly and just spread them throughout the rest of the islands. So I think that a lot of players, but yes, uh, we, we give praise to our mayor as well. Thank you. Our next question is assuming everyone did buy and eat locally produced food, what percentage of the population could that local supply feed in Hawaii at this time? We'll jump in on that. Um, un Unfortunately, we don't have much in the way of statistics in terms of local food production and local food consumption. We, we know uh, that there is more demand for local produce than there is supply, at least from some studies of late. But unfortunately, the state hasn't been regularly collecting data on production since about 2008. Uh, there was about to be a revamping of the statistical department, and hopefully that continues, but the Department of Agriculture, like all for portions of the state at this point, are uh, in a period of figuring out how much belt tightening can happen. So hopefully those stats will, will make it through because at this point we don't really have much in the way of baselines. What we, what we can say about it is that we do have a fair amount of local diversified production. And a lot of that production um, can be centralized in larger operations, uh, but we also know that the majority of farms in the state are smallholders. And so when we think about increasing productivity, we have a lot of farmers uh, and part-time farmers that are working often at the margins of the marketplace that through programming like food hubs, like um, training programs can help them increase their productivity and increase their participation in the food marketplace that can increase the availability of local produce for everyone. Thank you. The next question is why is there no info on Oahu? I understand there is no representative, but there is, is there no one to speak on behalf of the largest population in the islands? I wouldn't say that, oh, sorry, it's Hunter again to jump in. So part of my, part of my position is actually working with the Kupuna Food Security Coalition that is focused on Oahu. Um, we, I didn't incorporate any of that specific data because in this particular meet, um, webinar I was trying to focus on some of the statewide work. There is certainly no shortage of 
of programming happening on Oahu um, and are excited that the Office of Climate Change, Sustainability and Resilience has uh, put out a position to have a food access coordinator um, type position that will be hired uh, pretty soon. Thank you, Hunter. So this next question is for Tammy. At a state level, one puka we have is reaching out to non-English folks. Are you creating SNAP information in Native Hawaiian, Micronesian languages, et cetera? This is a need that we have. That is a great question. Um, in our office, in the Department of Health, we work on the food access piece of it. Uh, the Department of Human Services actually handles um, the SNAP specific work and I have been on conversations with them and I do know that they are working on having some of their information translated and I believe they already have on some of the others. I don't work in that office so I can't specifically say um, what that is but I do know that they have been translated in some of their stuff. Thank you. The next question is for Sarah. Are there any grants or scholarships in the works for the Big Island farmers or those students in agriculture? Specifically, I can't think of um, specific grants for that at this time. Um, I don't know if anyone else has any more information on that. Um, but, you know, with um, but with, you know, county grants or other opportunities, you know, nonprofits that do provide opportunities like that do apply and county, the county does fund um, programs like that. Thank you. The next question is, is climate change science being considered in food access and security initiatives? If so, can you give an example? Hmm. I can jump in there. I, I think that the the climate analysis, I, I spent a couple of years working on crop suitability modeling, trying to factor in um, project climate change projections to assess what type of uh, impacts we're likely to see for some of the predominant uh, crops that we have across the state. That work hasn't uh, factored into some of this thinking just yet. Uh, I think we're still very much in the response period. But I think as we get a better sense and are able to get stabilized in terms of how, how this response work can continue going forward, uh, that ideally, particularly when framing it as, as resilience planning, I think we'll have a lot more of that climate change focus integrated. Thank you. So I do want to apologize. I do want to honor everyone's time. So I apologize to those questions that we did not get to today. We will do our best to get those answers to you folks. Um, but before I wrap up, just wanted to turn it back over to our speakers for any last minute um, thoughts you'd like to leave with the attendees. Should we go in order like we did before? <laughs> Um, I just I, I just want to thank everybody for um, attending today because that just shows that you have the same passion that we have. I want to thank Tammy and the Department of Health and Hawaii Public Health Institute as well as my food access coordinator partners here. Um, we meet regularly. We um, throw ideas off one another, find out what the other counties are doing, and, and really try to get everybody's best practices in place. And um, again, it's an honor to be able to do the work that we're doing. It's, com it's pivoting daily. It's, uh, it's crazy how the changes can happen in one day, but I, I think that if we all stay firm in our commitments and stay firm in our convictions that we can really uh, show um, not only our county, but our state and, and um, the mainland, really how it should be done and, and um, how we can be self-supportive and, and sustaining and, and feed our people at the same time. Thank you. Um, yeah, I definitely want to echo Joelle and thanking Tammy, Department of Health. Um, it's awesome being able to collaborate with all of the food access coordinators um, across the state and I think one of the 
kind of like last minute takeaways would be for folks to definitely get involved to, for me to please reach out um, for Maui County uh, when it comes to any issues that you're seeing, gaps that you're seeing, um, the more data we can collect, I think the better we can help inform our local county council, but also for our state reps um, and senators as well. Uh, we definitely need to make sure that any funding that's coming down during this pandemic is gonna be used for food security and how we can provide um, recommendations for infrastructure for that. So please get involved and please reach out. The more collaboration we have across the state and within our counties, um, I think the better off we're gonna be for sure in the future. Thank you. I wanna echo also what Joelle and uh, Lauren just shared. Um, yeah, please connect. Uh, if you're on Hawaii Island and you aren't already connected and you wanna be involved, it really does take all of us. And, you know, learning more about where your food comes from and connecting with your food is always important as well. But um, I know we're out of time, so I just wanna, I'm really, I'm also, thank you, Tammy, and thank you, the Hawaii County. Um, it's really been amazing and an honor to be in this position and to serve in this role. Um, thank you. So uh, just, just in closing, I think it's, it's important that we continue to do this work. Um, we shouldn't try to just measure ourselves by how many are fed or how local their plate was, right? Even though that's a lot of my sort of data focus, but I think particularly that we should be weighing our well-being as a community, as a state, um, against the, the extant hardships, the remaining hardships that our society has yet to address. And we can see that this pandemic has created an economic crisis but it is leading communities to redefine well-being, wealth, and ideally we'll be breaking open new opportunities for us to, to create a better world and a better state. And I will um, also, um, sorry, I wanna thank everybody um, for having us here today. And I want to also thank the Department of Human Services who does provide us the SNAP-Ed funding and enabled us to, change our focus several years back in order to support this food access work. Um, and I wanna thank um, the County of Hawaii, Malama Kauai and the Hawaii Public Health Institute for stepping up and taking on this project. This is a long-term project. It's going to take a lot of work and um, it is a community-based approach. So we need community partners involved if we're gonna make this work. So my hope is, is that everyone on this webinar, um, when you get off of this, find out about your local coalition, contact your coordinator, see how you can get involved. If you can help, please help. Um, and yeah, thank you everybody. Thank you. Um, to Tammy and Hunter, Sarah, Joelle, and Lauren for being our guests today. Um, I want to thank all of the attendees that joined as well. Thank you to the HiFi staff behind the scenes um, helping make this webinar run smoothly. I do want to remind everyone that we have moved to a, a every other week um, for, the, for our webinars. And so our next webinar will be on Wednesday, July 8th, again from 1 to 2 p.m. The topic will be Sharing a Just Future, a panel of Hawaii's youth leaders. Mahalo again for joining us, and we hope to see you in two weeks. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>